everyone. So today I'm going to take a little bit of a different approach. I'm going to try to do a video lecture for you. Uh, I know it's sometimes easier to, to kind of process information when you can see the person who's talking to you. Um, the reason I don't usually do this is because it takes up a lot more processing time um, and the video files are kind of much larger afterwards, so it makes them a little uh, trickier to deal with. But um, I figured since I have, you know, a couple days till this one really needs to be up, then I can take that extra time. And if the video lecture is something that you do find a little bit more helpful than just hearing me talk over the slides, let me know. And I can maybe consider doing some more lectures like this in the future. So today we are going to talk about the third and final module of chapter 12. So we're going to talk about the psychodynamic and humanistic approaches to personality. So, so far we went through some of the trait theories, which are kind of our newer models of personality. They have a lot of empirical support behind them. Um, but in the beginning, a lot of the theories of personality were rooted in the unconscious. So Freud's psychodynamic uh, theory and the kind of psychoanalytical perspective where he was saying that, you know, the reasons we do the things we do and the behave the way we behave is because of these unconscious motives and desires we have. Um, and we'll talk a bit about humanistic approaches to personality as well. I will be honest, about 95% of this module is going to be focused on psychodynamic, um, but we will kind of bring in some of the humanist perspective at the end. So to get started, as I just mentioned, initial theories of personality were really heavily rooted in that Freudian psychodynamic perspective. Um, so they basically focused on personality as being kind of like a battleground between opposing forces in the psyche. Um, and then we have Maslow, and you might remember Maslow from his hierarchy of needs, as well as other humanistic psychologists who explored a more positive growth oriented side to personality. So the psychodynamic was more about like those unconscious motives and desires that might lead us to do um, less than great things, whereas Maslow and the humanist psychologists were very much, you know, um, talking a bit more about the, the positive and the potential for growth. So although neither Freudian or humanistic theories of personality have retained their once prominent positions, they're not really as popular as they used to be, they still can be highly influential in society at large, and they've inspired and guided many generations of people. So we'll talk a bit more about some of those theories. So we'll begin with the psychodynamic perspective. So despite Freud being one of the best known and most influential psychologists of all times, his theories haven't really stood the test of time. Um, so many are difficult to integrate with more modern approaches, and a lot of his research was impossible to falsify. So if you remember way back in chapter one and two, when we were talking about the concept of a falsifiable hypothesis, well, Freud would state his hypotheses in a way that there wasn't really any way you could definitively prove him wrong. Um, so, for example, he was really into kind of dream analysis and, you know, how can you prove that his interpretation of a dream is incorrect? Um, so regardless of the criticisms, Freud was a pioneer in terms of the study of personality, as well as the treatment of psychological disorders, which we'll get to talk about in a few chapters. Freud was a neurologist. Um, he left his scientific career to train as a physician, so he wanted to become a doctor. Um, and then shortly after, he began to accept clients who sought his help for psychological difficulties. Um, so he basically started to realize that the emotional struggles they were having couldn't often be understood on that more physiological level. Um, so over time, his observations and ideas evolved into what we know as psychodynamic theory. So there's kind of a universal assumption that underlies psychodynamic theory and, and kind of psychoanalysis as a perspective and a treatment, and that would be that personality and behavior are shaped by powerful forces, many of which stem from our unconscious. So from a psychodynamic perspective, there are no mistakes and we have very little control over ourselves or insights into our reasoning. Um, so for example, the, a term that was coined based on kind of Freud's ideas was the Freudian flip. So when you say something, even if it's something that you didn't mean to say, Freud would say that there's kind of a more hidden meaning or understanding of why you said one thing instead of the other thing. So that was what was kind of known as a Freudian slip, that you're actually kind of letting out your unconscious motives and desires um, through that means. So psychodynamic theorists would say that everything we think, feel, and do results from psychodynamic, psychological dynamics that are so deeply buried in our unconscious that we have no direct way of accessing them. Um, so basically, these are things that we have very little control over, and but there is kind of an underlying reason behind all of the things we think, do, and feel. So Freud distinguished between different levels of mental life most importantly between conscious and unconscious. So he kind of had some ideas about the different levels of consciousness. He would say that the conscious mind is our current awareness, 
basically everything we're aware of right now, whereas our unconscious mind is, is much more vast. It's, it's got a lot more in it um, and powerful but inaccessible part of your consciousness. So he says it basically operates without your conscious endorsement or will to influence and guide your behaviors. So Freud would say that the conscious mind houses your full lifetime of memories and experiences, as well as your preferences and desires. So he would say it's viewed primarily as a driver of our behaviors and controls us in many ways. Um, and again, kind of what I mentioned with the Freudian slip, um, based on the psychodynamic theory, it would say that even trivial slips of the tongue were argued to reflect our unconscious. So if you accidentally called um, you know, your spouse by another person's name, that would mean that, you know, you're probably unconsciously thinking about that other person or something along those lines. Um, so we'd say, you know, everything you say and do is for a reason. So in terms of how we structure personality, Freud hypothesized that the human psyche consists of three basic structures. We have the id, which represents a collection of basic biological drives, including those directed towards sexual aggression. Um, so Freud basically believed that this was fueled by an energy called the libido, and it operated according to what we would call the pleasure principle. So the id kind of wants what it wants. It's those base desires and urges we have, and it doesn't really care what gets in the way or who's affected. Then on the polar opposite side of that, we have something called the superego which comprise, um, is comprised of our values and our moral standards. So it would tell us what we ought to do, whereas the id would tell us what we want to do. So we've got the id on one hand that says, you know, do what makes you feel good. And then we have the super ego that says, do what's best, um, you know, for society or the greater good, whatever. And then kind of in between those two, we have a third part called the ego which is the decision maker. So it's frequently under tension because, you know, the id is saying one thing, the superego is saying the other thing. And so basically the ego is caught between and it's trying to reconcile those opposing urges. Um, and so we would say it operates on the reality principle um, and seeks to kind of balance between those two other forces. So the id is very kind of like, do what you want to do, do what makes you feel good. The superego is almost too much the other way in terms of being like very rigid and moralistic. And then the ego is the one who's kind of stuck in the middle trying to balance those two. So here's a really nice diagram that kind of illustrates what's going on in terms of the Freudian structure of personality. So you can see that um, one of the popular ways of depicting consciousness is kind of like the tip of the iceberg. Um, so we know that with an iceberg, you know, 90% of it is below the surface. So Freud would kind of use that analogy to say, okay, your conscious mind is only kind of the tip of the iceberg and the unconscious is everything below the surface. Um, and you can also see how those three components of personality fit in here. So you have the ego, which is somewhat conscious, somewhat unconscious. You have the super ego, which has a very small amount of consciousness, largely unconscious, and then the id is fully unconscious. Um, so again, it's consisting of those, you know, base desires and urges you have. It's, it's not really something that you're consciously aware of. So basically, essentially based on the model that we were just describing, the id, the ego, and the superego are always in constant tension with each other, and it is this tension that gives rise to personality in two different ways. So the first is that different personalities may reflect differences in the relative strengths of these three components. So each person's unique combination of biology, which would be kind of more related to their id, upbringing, which would help form their superego, and then personal awareness and will, which would kind of be more the ego um, part there, end up developing into their personality. So all three of those kind of come together depending on how strong they are and, and how much you kind of internalize each one, they would determine how your overall personality is structured. The second is that personality development is influenced by how one reacts to anxiety. Um, and so anxiety is basically the experiential result of the tension between the id, the ego, and the superego. So when, you know, the id wants to do one thing, the superego wants to do another thing, and you've got the poor ego kind of trying to balance things in the middle, that can create a lot of anxiety. Um, and so then basically Freud would say when these systems are out of balance, we experience anxiety, which drives the negative thoughts and feelings, and then we get that signal that something isn't quite right. So according to Freud, the ego is engaging in anxiety defense throughout the day. So in order to kind of try to balance those urges and relieve that anxiety, um, you know, Freud basically saw the consciousness as kind of a, a battleground for the ego. And so he felt that sometimes if the ego was unable to resolve anxieties, it'll attempt to protect itself through the use of defense mechanisms, which is something you've probably all heard of at one point or another. <laughs> 
So defense mechanisms are unconscious strategies that the ego uses to reduce or avoid anxiety. So for example, denial, rationalization, displacement. Um, you know, you've probably heard of some of these and I'll get to a few more in a minute. Um, but basically, defense mechanisms are able to kind of protect us from some of that resulting anxiety in the moment, but they are ultimately dysfunctional because what they're doing is allow us to avoid confronting undesirable tendencies and dealing with our problems. And we'll talk about this a lot more in chapters 15 and 16 when we get into kind of the more uh, clinical psychology stuff, the, the uh, you know, psychological disorders. But one of the main things that we target in interventions for psychological illness is avoidance, because avoidance is something that can really kind of help uh, prolong negative emotions. And, and, you know, you get into these patterns of avoidance that lead to you never really feeling any better. Um, so to this day, Freud's work on defense mechanisms remains influential, uh, particularly in the mental health field, like I kind of just mentioned. And it's important to note, I guess, that although a lot of Freud's theories don't really have any empirical support or backing, some of the defense mechanisms actually have been. Um, so that's one of his contributions that actually does have some empirical support behind it for, for certain mechanisms. Just, just to go through um, a few kind of basic ones that you probably heard of some of them before and give you a little bit of a definition. Um, we'll go through five of the primary defense mechanisms. The first will be repression, um, which is basically if you have a threatening idea or a memory or an emotion, you kind of block it from your consciousness. Um, so, you know, if you were abused as a child or something really bad happened to you, you take that memory and you kind of lock it away where your consciousness can't access it. Um, so it can involve both unconscious expulsion, so basically that memory, you just kind of shoved it in without even realizing you were doing it, or conscious suppression, where we actively said, no, I don't want to think about this anymore, and we're able to kind of push that into our unconscious. The second would be projection, which is when a person's own unacceptable or threatening feeling is repressed and attributed to some, someone else. So for example, um, if you are feeling a lot of anger towards your boss because your boss, you know, you don't feel like they're treating you unfairly, then you might say, you know, my boss is such an angry person. They're always, you know, being really mean and doing all these really aggressive things. So you're taking the emotion that you're feeling and you're attributing to them instead, saying that they're the one who's aggressive. They're the one that's, that's angry. Um, so you're basically projecting your emotion onto them. Displacement um, is kind of a similar one to that. So it's when people direct their emotions towards something. So for example, it could be a thing, it could be an animal, it could be other people, other than the real object of their feelings. So if you, let's keep going with that example, you're really mad at your boss, and instead you go home and yell at your husband or you yell at your wife. That will be an example of displacement. So you don't feel like you're able to kind of let those feelings out and release them towards the person you're really mad at, which is your boss. So you basically take them and kind of displace them onto someone else, which obviously is, is not a good thing to do. It can lead to a lot of additional issues. Um, but at times there is a particular type of displacement called sublimation, where displacement can kind of be a little bit more positive. So if you, you've ever heard of someone who has, you know, negative emotions and they channel it into, say, writing music or, um, you know, acting or whatever, that would be an example of sublimation. So taking those negative, unacceptable emotions and kind of channeling them into something that's a bit more productive, um, that would be sublimation. The same kind of thing could be, you know, someone who has a lot of anger, maybe they... Um, take that anger and direct it into becoming really good at boxing or MMA or something like that. So um, anytime you're kind of using that displacement for the, the greater good in a way, like channeling into something more productive, um, that would be considered sublimation. And then we have regression, which is when a person reverts to a previous stage of psychological development. So for example, you may have a child who's, you know, nine or 10 years old and they haven't wet the bed in years and then maybe their parents are going through a rough spot, there's a divorce, or maybe, you know, they lost someone close to them, and then all of a sudden they start wetting the bed again. Um, so that would be an example of a regression, like basically you're reverting back um, to a previous developmental stage. Um, another example is, you know, if somebody encounters something really stressful and they revert back to childhood because they have fond memories of childhood and it being a place where they were safe. Um, so they're kind of reverting back to, to avoid thinking about, you know, the, the thing that's occurring in their life currently. Um, and then finally on this page, and there are way more than five of these, but these are just a few of the examples. I'll give you some more on the next slide. Um, but the fifth one that I want to kind of talk about is denial. And that one's pretty straightforward. People refusing to admit that something unpleasant is happening. 
Um, so they're trying to preserve their self image um, and that illusion of invulnerability. So basically thinking, you know, this, this isn't real, this isn't happening, this couldn't happen to me. Um, and that one is a really difficult one to deal with because obviously in order to address an issue, you kind of have to come to terms with the fact that an issue does exist. Um, but it is one that's kind of uh, used quite frequently. People just kind of straight up denying that anything is wrong. So as I mentioned, here are some more examples from the textbook. The ones on the previous slide were actually from a previous textbook, uh, but this is the, the table that's in your textbook now. Um, I think this is the one from the last edition, so I think the number might be a little different. Um, I think it might be table 12.3 or 12.5 in the new textbook, um, but the same information is in it. So we have denial, displacement, identification, um, which is another one I didn't really get into, projection, rationalization, reaction formation, repression, and sublimation. So you can take a look at them. I'm not going to ask you anything in crazy detail about the defense mechanisms, but you should be able to kind of identify what one is happening. Like say if I gave you a scenario in a multiple choice question, you should be able to tell me, oh, you know, that's an example of projection or that's an example of displacement. So now we're going to get into the weird part of Freud's theories, um, as if his other theories weren't weird enough, um, but he created something known as the psychosexual stages. Um, and so basically he had this theory of personality and he put into it a description of various stages of development. So he believed that the personality developed as the person learned to channel the energy from the libido, which again, if, if you remember, was kind of that energy that drives the id into appropriate forms of expression. So in his mind, the infant or very young child is ruled by the id. They basically do what they do because it makes them feel good and because they get what they need. And therefore, young children struggle to contain or channel sexual urges and feelings. Um, so he would state then that development is therefore based on the proper development of the ego and the superego through socialization experiences. So in order to combat that id that kind of um, dominates, you know, our really early life, we're going to need to develop um, a really strong ego and super ego to kind of keep things in check. So Freud highlighted specific developmental challenges that children faced, and he developed them into a stage theory of psychosexual development. So he would say at each stage that libido is manifesting itself in a particular area of the body. So the stages are kind of named um, after the various areas. So for example, obviously when a baby is born, they rely primarily on processes involving the use of their mouths. They can't really do a whole lot in those first few days after birth or even first few weeks and months. Um, so it's very much kind of focused on their mouth and obtaining nourishment and, and exploring with their mouth, um, with their mouths. Whereas for a toddler, learning to control their bowels is key. So at that point, you know, when you get into the toddler stage, you're probably more focusing on potty training and things like that. So if the child is able to release their libidinal energy appropriately through the relevant body part, it helps them to have a healthy relationship with themselves and progress to the next stage of development. However, if their need for satisfaction is thwarted, if they're not able to kind of navigate that stage successfully, they may unfortunately become fixated at a particular stage. Um, and so you've probably heard of things like an oral fixation before. That's That terminology actually comes from this theory. Um, so we'll get into that when we start to go through the stages. But basically a fixation involves becoming preoccupied with obtaining pleasure associated with a particular stage as a result of not being able to adequately regulate themselves and satisfy their needs at that stage. So if something happens and they're not really able to face that challenge at each stage of development, um, they kind of remain stuck there. Um, and so it can occur either due to conflict um, or due to overindulgence. So it can be kind of one of two things can lead to a fixation, but the, the end result is that that person is unable to kind of move past that stage and develop their personality appropriately. And I say a lot of this stuff with kind of air quotes, which might have been one of the reasons I wanted to have a video in this section, um, because as we know, a lot of Freud stuff doesn't really have much empirical support. And this is one of the things that doesn't have a lot of empirical support, but it was super influential in at the time in terms of trying to figure out how to describe personality and how it develops. So that's why we're still talking about it today. So the first stage, and I kind of alluded to this one a minute ago, is the oral stage. Um, so Freud would say that you're in this stage from zero to 18 months. The mouth is a major focus for both pleasure and frustration. So basically at this point, the ego is learning to satisfy the id's desire for biting and sucking. Um, if it is successfully now navigated, the infant develops a basic sense of security and empowerment. Um, and again, as we mentioned, like 
So the it is there all along, but we're trying to develop our ego and our super ego. So if you're able to successfully navigate it, you get that good foundation for the ego. But if unsuccessful or overindulged, they may develop oral fixations. So they're never really fully developing their ego. The next stage would be the anal stage. So this is from Freud would say about 18 months to three years. The toddlers begin to become aware of themselves as individuals. They start to kind of gain control over their bowels. So like we mentioned, toilet training is, is a really big focus of that stage. Um, and if it is navigated correctly, it will lead to a sense of competence and confidence. But if the parents are too strict, it might lead to someone becoming anal retentive, which is something you might have heard of before. So someone who's very rigid, very kind of wanting everything to be in a certain order and, and very kind of meticulous. Um, whereas on the other hand, if the parents are too lenient or don't provide support, it may lead to anal expulsive um, adults. So basically people who are more careless, messy, kind of disorganized all over the place. So the opposite of that anal retentive adult. Next, we have the phallic stage. Um, so this one was crucially important in Freud's view. This is the one that he said was probably the most important. This is also where the, the theory starts to get really strange. Um, so bear with me. So from three to six years, basically Freud said the bodily attention has shifted to the genitals. In this stage, boys go through the Oedipus complex where they wish to possess their mother and eliminate their father. They are very distressed to learn that their mothers do not have penises and they develop what is called castration anxiety. So basically they're looking at their mother and thinking, oh my God, she doesn't have a penis. You know, her powerful father must have cut it off her. So, you know, I should kind of stay in line and, and, you know, listen to my father. And so at that point they learn to resolve this fear by identifying with the father and repressing the sexual urges towards the mother. For girls, this logic doesn't really work because obviously we don't have penises to begin with. Um, so when they discover that they lack a penis, Freud says that we would experience a lingering penis envy and redirect our sexual interest to men because, of course, they're the ones with the penises. So that's obviously what we're looking for. Um, and so basically, Freud would say at its resolution, the child has formed a healthy relationship with the parents um, and that completes the formation of the superego. Um, if we get fixated at this stage, if we're unable to kind of successfully navigate that, it could lead to jealousy and obsession with sex. And he would also say that based on the fact girls don't have penises um, and we can't really fully, um, I guess, eliminate that penis envy that we have, we are never fully able to resolve these complexes and therefore we never fully develop our superego. So you can kind of see where there are some major issues coming into play, um, especially when his, his theory reached this stage. But again, we keep talking about it because it was very influential at the time and it's something that, um, you know, really helped lead to the foundations of personalities who know them today. So we still bring it up, even though it, it might be a little bit out to lunch. Next, we have the latency stage, which honestly, relatively boring compared to the others. Um, it's basically from around six to 13 years of age. So after you finish that phallic stage, but before you hit puberty, um, the ego and the super ego have achieved a degree of general calm. The sexual nature of the libido is de-emphasized during these years and channeled into more productive activities. Um, and so Freud would say this is kind of a period of rich development with no possibility for fixation. And then finally, his last stage would be the genital stage, begins with the onset of puberty. So once the person hits puberty, they are moved from that latency to the genital stage. The person emerges into a mature adult personality with a fully developed capacity for productive work and satisfying relationships. But if they had become fixated at a previous stage, they would have an undeveloped personality. Um, and so Freud would say that that having that undeveloped personality is one of the major reasons that people would eventually, you know, succumb maybe to mental illness and things like that. Um, so again, and, and this is kind of probably apparent at this point in his theories, unconscious is key. And that's, you know, things that happened in our childhood during development are basically at the root of all of our problems. So, um, you know, if someone comes to him with a particular psychological issue, he's likely to um, he was, I guess, he's not still alive, but uh, he was much more likely to kind of point to things that happened in their past as a cause of that problem. So modern psychodynamic psychologists generally agree that these stages are an accurate view of personality development and were hard or impossible to measure, but certain aspects seem to have some support. So again, not everything that Freud said was completely incorrect, but there are definitely some things that were a little bit more controversial or, or questionable about his theories.
And here's just a diagram that kind of goes through them. I'm not going to read them out right now. You can take a look through yourself if you'd like, um, but basically just kind of a, a little bit more of a description of each of the stages. Um, and again, this is not something I'm going to ask you to write about in detail, but you should be familiar with each of the stages, particularly those first three, because they are really kind of the key ones that you can kind of become fixated at um, and just kind of understand a little bit about what was supposedly going on in each um, and how that was affecting personality development. So now we're going to talk a bit about exploring the unconscious. So this is, and I've kind of mentioned this before, one of the major reasons that Freud's theories lack empirical support and that psychodynamic theories in general tend to lack empirical support is because how do you measure the unconscious? How can we reveal what somebody is thinking about below the surface when they're not even able to talk about it? Um, so one popular approach is to use what we call projective tests which are personality tests in which ambiguous images are presented to an individual to elicit responses that would basically be said to reflect unconscious desires or conflicts. Um, so what we're doing is we're basically giving them a test and asking them, you know, tell us what they see or write about it or whatever. And then we're taking whatever information they give us and interpreting it in some way um, to have, you know, a different meaning than basically the literal meaning of whatever they're saying. So one of the most famous projective tests, I'm sure you've all heard of this one before, is the Rorschach inkblot test, in which people are asked to describe what they see in an inkblot. And psychologists interpret this description using a standardized scoring and interpretation. Um, the inkblots are a little bit easier, I guess, because they do have kind of standard images, so they can have certain interpretations that might go along with each. Um, but basically what you're going to see is that um, you're going to take the general themes and trends of what people were seeing in that image and use those to interpret what it is they're actually feeling um, and thinking underneath the surface. Another common projective test is known as the thematic apperception test or the TAT, which asks respondents to tell stories about ambiguous pictures involving various interpersonal situations. So this one's a little bit more in depth instead of just asking them what they see in an image, you're actually asked to you know, describe what you think is happening here and, and provide a backstory for the image. And again, then you would interpret that um, using you know, some kind of interpretation guide or, or scoring. So here are some pictures of those tests that we were just talking about. So we see the Rorschach inkblot test here. Um, you know, you can try to measure personality characteristics by analyzing what people tell you they see in that image. Um, we have the thematic apperception test. So, you know, look at this picture and get the person to tell you a story about what's happening in the image or what happened right before. Um, and you can also do figure drawing as a projective test. This one is also used um, sometimes with children. Um, it can be really helpful. And, and again, not that a lot of these tests have much empirical support, but um, definitely with children, when it's harder for them to verbalize some things that they've been through or things that they're thinking, it is sometimes easier to ask them to you know, draw a picture. Um, and um, it does really, a lot of the time, doesn't really tell you a lot about personality, but it can be kind of a helpful way of even establishing rapport. Um, that's one thing I will say for these tests, despite the fact that projective tests, obviously you can't empirically validate them because how do we know what somebody's thinking underneath the surface? But if nothing else, using them with your clients can help build that sense of rapport and that therapeutic alliance um, just to get them comfortable with talking to you and opening up. So they can be kind of helpful in, in that respect. But unfortunately, as I've mentioned, projective tests have not fared well in empirical research. Um, they have low reliability and validity and research has indicated serious limitations. Again, the major one being how do you interpret these interpretations? You know, like, where is that coming from? Um, so despite criticisms, and this is what I was kind of mentioning a minute ago, many therapists claim to have experienced significant breakthroughs using projective testing. In the mid-1990s, a survey indicated that 43% of clinical psychologists and psychiatrists made frequent use of these types of tests, although their popularity does seem to be declining in recent years. So now um, we are basically going to talk about some alternatives. So as I mentioned, the psychodynamic approach, um, specifically that psychoanalytical approach that Freud came up with was kind of one of the major dominating theories of personality for a long time. Um, but we'll talk about a few other approaches that are kind of within the psychodynamic realm. And then we'll talk very briefly about uh, humanist approaches as well. So Freud had a lot of followers, um, you know, his, his ideas were really new and controversial and exciting at the time, but some of his contemporaries took psychodynamic psychology in different directions. Um, so Freud really focused on section aggression, 
as being those really kind of driving personality development uh, factors that kind of are really driving development. Um, but others focus on the need for things like belonging, achievement, and integrity or kind of wholeness. So Carl Jung, and I know you've heard his name mentioned before, he founded the analytical psychology movement, which focuses on the role of unconscious archetypes in personality development. So Jung believed that these archetypes were housed in a unique region of the unconscious. So whereas Freud said that we have kind of this, you know, vast unconscious that holds a whole bunch of thoughts and ideas and memories and things like that, Jung believed that there were actually two main types of unconscious. The first was the personal unconscious, which was basically the same as Freud had explained, that kind of, um, you know, storage area for all of these experiences and patterns and things that somebody has absorbed throughout their own personal life as an individual. But Jung also said there was a second type called the collective unconscious, and that this was separate and non-personal realm of consciousness, unconsciousness, that holds collective memories and mythologies of, of humankind. Um, and he would basically say that this collective unconscious stretches deep into our ancestral past and is basically something that we as humans kind of all share in. So not only do we have access to our, or maybe not so much access because it's unconscious, but we have our own personal unconscious that kind of exists within our own mind is based on our own experiences and things like that. We also have a collective unconscious that's based um, on kind of our evolutionary history and things that we experienced, um, you know, during humankind. Um, and so he would say that the personal unconscious is housed within the person, but the collective unconscious is more like a large field of forces and it contains archetypes, which I kind of mentioned on the last slide. But these are images and symbols that reflect common patterns of experience across all cultures. So, for example, whenever you hear a story, um, you know, if somebody you watch a movie or you read a book, there's usually always going to be kind of like the hero you know, the person who's kind of like the main character. Um, a lot of the times there's kind of like a trickster character, someone who's kind of up to no good and scheming. Um, a lot of the times we'll have the wise old man, um, you know, who's kind of that character that other characters go to for guidance, things like that. The shadow, which would be kind of the, the main antagonist, the kind of bad guy. Um, and so basically Jung said that these important archetypes um, they kind of represent major narrative patterns in our human experience. So when these symbols appeared in dreams, he would say that you could interpret them and it would give us important insights into a person's growth and well-being. So when they appeared in our dreams, it's because we were kind of taking them in from that collective unconsciousness um, and they could reveal something about what was going on with us in the moment and how we could possibly kind of grow and, and feel better. And so finally, we're going to move on from kind of the uh, psychodynamic approaches now. So Alfred Adler distinguished himself from Freud's approach to personality by arguing for the importance of social dynamics and conscious thoughts. So now we're moving away from the unconscious. We're saying, you know, the things that we think about consciously matter too, um, as well as our social relationships. So he rejected the centrality of that pleasure principle, which was kind of what was driving the id. Um, and he instead emphasized the inferiority complex, which is the struggle that many people have with feelings of inferiority. And this could stem from experiences of helplessness and powerlessness during childhood. So he's still saying that, you know, the things that impact us as a child can influence later in life. But at this point, he's also um, kind of talking about the fact that, um, you know, we can have conscious thoughts and social interactions that influence our development as well. So Adler stated that many people try to compensate for feelings of inferiority by trying to appear more confident or superior to others. Um, and we've talked about, I mean, I don't even know if we've talked about it, but it's something that you notice so often in life that often the people who act like they think they know everything and they're very kind of abrasive and kind of like a know-it-all, a lot of the time that appears to be compensating for the fact that they really don't feel like they know enough, that they really do feel insecure. We always say, you know, when someone is presenting themselves as really confident, um, that a lot of the time that does come from inner insecurities and feelings of inferiority. Um, that's not always the case, but a lot of the time it can be. Then we had Karen Horney, um, who also disagreed with Freud's heavy emphasis on sex, and she focused on the importance of social and cultural factors and the role of interpersonal, um, sorry, it's cut off on my slide. I can't really see it right here, um, but I guess interpersonal interactions. 
And then finally, to very briefly talk about the humanist perspectives. So humanist psychologists rejected the pessimism, pessimism and disempowerment inherent in Freudian approaches. As I mentioned right at the beginning, you know, the Freudian approaches really were um, kind of more focusing on the negative things, focusing on, you know, the issues that have arisen because of our experiences. Um, and so humanist psychologists wanted to focus more on the positive, um, focus on exploring the potential for humans to become truly free and deeply fulfilled. Uh, so humanists highlight an individual's capacity for free will and making their own choices and try to focus more on positive motivations for personal growth and development. So Carl Rogers was somebody who was really heavily influential in terms of like the humanist perspectives of development, as well as, um, you know, using those perspectives as a therapeutic approach. Um, so he championed what we call a person centered perspective. So it was founded on the assumption that people are basically good, we're all kind of inherently good, and given the right environment, their personality will develop fully and normally. So Rogers believed that people possess immense resources for growth and resilience and a desire for self-actualization. And if you remember Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that self-actualization was actually something that he talked about way on the top of the hierarchy, right? So um, our, we are at our most fulfilled when we're able to kind of grow and fulfill our full potential. Um, and so that would be that concept of self-actualization. So finally, and I, I kind of want to mention this here because I did mention it way back at the beginning, uh, I think in module one, when I was talking about how sometimes people will write personality descriptions that are so vague that basically in reading them, you're like, yeah, of course that's me. You know, it, it definitely applies to me. Um, and so that's what we, and I, I know I did mention this very briefly back then, but that's what we call the Barnum effect. So it refers to using descriptions so vague and flattering when creating things like horoscopes that they appeal to almost anyone. Um, and so, for example, there's a field called graphology, um, which is basically analysis of handwriting. Um, and a lot of people for a long time would say that, you know, looking at someone's handwriting, the way they make their, you know, loops and things like that, and the way they cross their T's and dot their I's, that would actually tell you something about their underlying personality. Um, but whenever you test something like this empirically, it has always failed. It never really has had any empirical support. Um, so if you want to kind of avoid becoming a victim of this Barnum effect, you should follow these suggestions. Generally, if you're reading a horoscope or you do something like the Myers-Briggs um, test for personality, that's another one that doesn't really have much empirical support, but people really rely heavily on their Myers-Briggs type. Um, so when you're reading stuff like that, just try to keep these things in mind. Um, so the first would be beware of all purpose descriptions that could apply to anyone, um, because nine chances out of 10, when you read a horoscope or you read, um, you know, something about, I don't know, tarot cards or whatever, like any kind of like pseudoscience you feel like that, you will find something there that you're like, hey, this really is me. It really sounds like something I would do or something I would think. But if you look at, you know, next time you look at a horoscope, look at all 12 of them. Don't just look at yours. And I bet you, you will find something in each one of those descriptions that appeals to you because they're written in a way that they could really apply to anyone. The second is to be beware, oh, sorry, to beware of your own selective perceptions. Um, so you don't want to fall prey to the confirmation bias. Uh, so, you know, and I kind of alluded to this a second ago, but like I said, if you look at those 12 horoscopes, you're probably going to find something in each one that speaks to you. And what happens then is you're more likely to focus on that thing that's correct and works for you and ignore the stuff that will be wrong. So make sure that you're not just looking for stuff to confirm the belief that this thing would fit you, that you're also looking for evidence to disprove it. And the third is to resist flattery and emotional reasoning. So obviously a lot of the time when people are writing these horoscopes or these personality profiles, they're going to write it in a way that makes you feel good. Like, you know, you have a lot of insight, you know, you're going to do something really intelligent, blah, blah, blah. Like it, they write it in a way that it's flattering for you. And of course, it's much harder for us to reject a profile that makes you feel good. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's, it's a lot harder to do that than it will be to reject something that says something negative about you. Um, so just keep these things in mind whenever you're doing those little, you know, personality tests online or looking up your horoscopes and things like that, that a lot of the time, the reason that you might feel so, like it so strongly fits you is due to the Barnum effect. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to kind of bring that up at the end um, because I think it's really important in terms of knowing how to analyze these things critically, just like we would hopefully analyze most of the information that we're taking in critically each day.
So that is the end of our personality chapter. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I personally probably find this module the most interesting of the three, even though a lot of what we talked about maybe doesn't have the best empirical support. Um, but now you kind of know a bit more about Freud and his theories, and you can maybe understand a bit more about why I kind of roll my eyes when I say his name sometimes. Um, if you have any questions, definitely let me know. So after this, um, this will be for our Friday's class. Then we're going to have a full week off for a midterm break. Um, and then we're going to come back the next week. And I think I actually scheduled us a day off on the Monday. Just I had it there in case we needed it. I don't think we will. Um, so hopefully you'll get to do a little bit more extended relaxing in that class. And then I think on that Wednesday we're back. We're going to have a review for our next test. And then I believe our next test is scheduled for that Friday after the break. So if you have any questions, definitely let me know. I'll try to get a review guide up for you as soon as possible. And I guess I will see you all in the review session after the break. So I hope you all have a great break and I will talk to you later.